So the Pharisees want to uh, trick Jesus. They want to say, which of the commandments are number one? So if he says, well, it's number one, then they will say, well, what about number eight? And they want to, they want to trick him up. So the Pharisee, the religious leader, says to Jesus, which is the greatest commandment? And so Jesus says this in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 22, verse 37. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and the first commandment. He's quoting here the book of Deuteronomy and the law of Moses. Love God with everything you have, with your entire being. And then he goes on to say this in verse 39 and 40. And a second is like it, is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and all the prophets. And it's this last part that I'd like us to uh, just kind of explore. Love your neighbor as yourself. So we get the part about loving God, right? That's why we're, we're worshiping, we're praying, we're singing songs of praise and thanksgiving. We're worshiping God. And loving our neighbor, that is really part of our DNA, right? It's in our wheelhouse here at First Baptist in Beverly. We're a leader in affordable housing. We provide over 156 meals every week to our neighbors at need. We're working collaboratively with, with First Parish today, and we're housing uh, and su providing support for 12 of our neighbors, adults and children who otherwise would be living on the streets right here in the North Shore. So loving our neighbor, we get that, right? But we are also called, says Jesus, to love our neighbor as ourself. Carl Jung, who was, an, who was a contemporary of Sigmund Freud, actually a student of Freud, two of the founders of the modern, modern psychology movement, says the gateway to loving your neighbor is first and foremost to love yourself. Kind of an underpinning of modern therapy today is if you don't love yourself, it's difficult to love others, even to love God. And so Carl Jung, in reflecting on this very passage from Jesus, says, the gateway to loving your neighbor fully and loving God completely is first to love yourself. And now that may seem kind of counterintuitive because some of us were born, were raised up in families where we were supposed to be modest, right? Not, my dad would always say, Kent, don't blow your own horn. Any, any parent ever say that? Yeah. So, or, or we, may, we may think that we don't want to become, uh, you know, someone that other people are saying, well, he's always calling attention to him or herself. You don't want to be one of those people. You don't want to be considered a narcissist. You don't want to draw the attention to yourself. And some of us have grown up playing tapes in our head where from our family of origin, perhaps, or some, maybe it was in school, some wound or hurt that we carry that tells us that we're not all that good, where we may have difficulty loving ourselves. Some of us have what a friend of mine calls, we have tapes we play in our head, and he, she calls it stinking thinking. That when we're not at our best, maybe we were tired, maybe we're kind of overwhelmed, we play tapes in our head, some of us, I know I do, that, that kind of knocks me down a few pegs, where I don't always think the best about myself. How about you? Some of us, more than others, I think as part of the human condition, we have those tapes that we play that don't serve us so well. But the gateway, says Carl Jung, is to first and foremost love ourselves. William Barclay, the theologian, uses that Latin phrase, amago Dei, the image of God to say that we are to see ourselves through God's eyes, that we are each created in the image of God, imago Dei. And if we believe that to be true, then we each have inherent worth, don't we? If, if we are created with the fingerprints of God 
upon us, that we are created in the image of the Creator, then we each have inherent worth. True? And so those negative tapes that some of us more than others play in our heads, we need to learn to let go of those tapes. And we need to hear the tapes of our Creator who says that we're beautiful, that we're cherished, that we're known. The prophet Jeremiah was told that before Jeremiah was even formed in his mother's womb, God knew him by name. That is being cherished, isn't it? That is being the beloved. To be known by God from the very beginning of time, even before we are shaped in our own mother's womb, we are known by God. And do we believe that to be true? So I have a little exercise for you here. I'd like you to just imagine you have a piece of paper and a pen. And I want you to imagine writing down 10 things you really like about yourself. 10 things you really like about yourself. Okay, get your imaginary pen. John, you have it? Okay, paper. When do you have it? All right, everybody. Start writing. Okay, 10 things you really, really like about yourself. For the sake of time, I'll kind of move the process forward. You can practice this at home. Now I want you to think of 20 things you'd like to change about yourself. In your imaginary piece of paper, 20 things you'd like to change about yourself. Go ahead. And I'll speed the process up. Try it at home. Which is easier to do? To write 10 things you really like about yourself or 20 things you'd like to change about yourself? I think for a lot of us, it's things we'd like to change about yourself. I would like to have a great tan. I grew up in a predominantly Italian neighborhood. We'd go to the beach. My friends got the best golden tan. And they called me the torch because I would just be sunburned. I would just be sunburned. So I would love to have pigment that would tan. That would just be awesome. I'd like to be better in math. I struggled with math in school. I worked way so hard, too hard. I would love to be better at math. I would like to have more hair. When I was a young guy, I had beautiful hair. Brian, I had great hair. Chestnut, wavy, curly hair. Not so much anymore. I wish I had more hair. And I wish I hit one home run in Little League. I'm a big baseball fan. Hit one, one home run in my entire career. I would like to be able to hit the long ball. We all have things we'd like to change about ourselves, right? We all have things that we'd like to see improved. And sometimes we may struggle to claim those things that are good about ourselves. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Carl Jung would say it's hard to love your neighbor fully unless you love yourself. Jesus understood this to be true. We need to value ourselves and see ourselves through the eyes of the Christ and to see ourselves through the eyes of God. Now, we all know that we're imperfect, right? But God has a habit throughout the Bible of choosing unlikely imperfect people to bring about the good and the extraordinary. I mean, think about Jacob. Jacob tried to, he ripped off his brother's birthright and made it his own. He lied to his father. Yet God used Jacob to bring about that which was extraordinary and gave birth to the nation of Israel. God chooses unlikely people like Jacob. God chooses unlikely people like you and me. And God uses us in our imperfection with our weaknesses and our strengths, with our frailty and our strength, to bring about that which is life-giving. So the invitation is to be kind to ourselves, to see ourselves through God's eyes. 
Richard Bach said, argue for your limitations long enough, and sure enough, they're yours. Jesus is saying, stop arguing for your limitations. See yourselves through the eyes of God. You are created imago Dei in the very image of God. Believe that. Make that a part of yourself. And when we do that, everything, everything is changed. I'm going to paraphrase Julie's sermon from about a month ago. And that the phrase, the, the quote was something like, our perfect imperfection. That we are perfectly imperfect. So let go of, an, of any illusion that we will have our act fully together. Accept ourselves with our frailty as well as our strengths, with our gifts and with our weaknesses, and know that God always argues for our potential. God saw the potential in Jacob, who was a thief and a ripoff artist and a liar. God saw the potential in Jacob and brought about that which was life-giving. We're not to argue for our limitations. God always sees what we're capable of becoming. And do we believe that to be true? Can we be kind to ourselves? Can we love and value ourselves as the very child of God. This is profound stuff because people are tough on one another. I was reading a study about anxiety in adolescents and young adults and that it is there are many young people who are profoundly struggling. I'm a trustee at a little liberal arts college in the Pacific Northwest. And in the 16 years that I've been a trustee, I've seen the growth of, of support that students require because they come oftentimes with a, with a sense of struggle, not feeling good enough, not feeling like they fit in, with anxiety a part of their daily life. This is real, not only for young people, but it's real for us adults of whatever age. We argue for our limitations, and God calls us, Jesus calls us, to argue for our beauty and our strengths and our gifts because we are created in the image of God. Many years ago, I was serving a church in Vallejo, California, in the Bay Area. And there was a young guy in the youth group named Leonard, not his real name. But Leonard was a, a young kid about 15 years old who came into the youth group, and we were his family. His dad was in prison because he had physically and sexually abused Leonard. His mom was an addict, and in truth, Leonard was raising his mom. And so he came to church and he came to youth group every week as if he were searching for oxygen. We were the source of stability in Leonard's life. I was in that church for about five years. Leonard by then was in his um, late teens. And I moved to another community and I lost touch with Leonard. And I always wondered what happened to him because the odds were so stacked against him. This boy who was abused by the one he should have trusted and a mom that he couldn't rely upon. Think of the wounds and the scars that that boy carried. And I wondered what would become of his life. So fast forward about 15 years, and I'm in a pool, swimming pool, in McMinnville, Oregon, where I was pastoring a church. And I have my daughter, Caitlin, who's three years of age, and it's a class for parents and small children to learn how to swim. And so it's just after the class, so I'm hanging out with Caitlin, and she's floating, and she's, I'm holding on to her. She's kicking her legs. She's learning how to be buoyant, how not to be afraid in the water. And there's another dad in the pool, too, with a small child. 
And that dad is coaxing, coaching that little child, a little girl too, teaching her how to swim. And I notice that this man, younger than me, is staring at me. And so I turn to him, and I look at him. I don't recognize him, and he smiles at me. And he comes over with his daughter floating, and I have my daughter floating in my arms, and he says, do you remember me? And I say, no. He says, I'm Leonard. He said, this is my daughter, and I'm moving from California up to Washington State, and I have a new job. He says, I'm a guidance counselor. I was a guidance counselor in the high school in California, and I have a new job, a promotion, uh, up in Washington State. And I just had to, my daughters, and I have another small child, and my wife, we're just getting tired of driving in the car, so we split up the kids, and I took my daughter to the pool. And I said, I'm so proud of you, Leonard. And he said, you know, all that stuff that I heard about in church was true. He said, I heard over and over again that God loved me. And so one day I decided to claim it and to believe that that was true. To believe that if I were really created in God's image, as all the Sunday school teachers and teachers had told me over the years, if I was created in God's image, then I don't have to be trapped in my past. I can become the man and the dad that I want to be because I'm okay. Loving oneself, says Carl Jung, is the gateway to loving our neighbor and believing that God loves us fully. It's a circle. It's reinforcing. Love of God, love of our neighbor, love of self, love of God, love of our neighbor, love of ourself. Our theme for the month of October has been kindness. And the challenge and the invitation is to be kind to ourselves. To see ourselves through the eyes of God as God's chosen and God's beloved. And then to see our neighbor through those same lens as God's chosen, as God's called as God's own. This is the good news. Thanks be to God. And may God's people say,